players. Um, okay. And then, all right. If you have any questions, we're the three of us are watching from here, so we'll we'll help you through anything that might come yeah. up. So yeah. appreciate you, and I'll get off here now. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me virtually here. Excited to give this talk. Um, I'm in California uh, at UCSF. My name is Chase. I'm uh, one of the head and neck surgeons and reconstructive surgeons here. Uh, just for a bit of background, uh, originally from Chicago, uh, did medical school training uh, at Loyola in Chicago, then came out here for residency to UCSF, stayed on one more year for the head and neck uh, reconstruction uh, fellowship, and then have been on uh, faculty since 2009. I'm sorry, 2014. Uh, so today, what I want to talk to you about is uh, salvage laryngectomy. Uh, in general, laryngectomy is probably one of my favorite procedures uh, in the primary setting, but I certainly struggle with aspects of it in the salvage setting uh, in helping these patients who have uh, often uh, quite serious problems. So I just want to give you some pearls on that. Uh, so you guys have probably dived pretty deep into the VA larynx paper, or hopefully you have. It's one of the you know, hallmark papers of our field that have, has changed uh, the way we treat larynx cancer. But just to remind you, this was a study out uh, in 1991. Uh, it was a randomized control trial that was comparing induction chemo and radiation uh, uh, to primary surgery and radiation at about 350 patients. And what they found was the overall survival and disease-free survival for these groups was similar. Hey, Dr. Heaton, your, yeah. um, your slides are not advancing on the screen. So uh, if you click on the enable editing and then um, go to um, presenter mode, because I think you're talking okay. about maybe your fourth Let's slide start. down there. There we go. Can you click down to make sure that it, okay, that shows VA larynx trial. And then VA larynx trial, larynx preservation. Okay, so that works. That that will work to do it that way. Yeah, that's one okay. way to do it. So, okay. okay, thank you. Okay, um, good, sorry about that. Uh, so back to this so they found that the survival overall survival disease-free survival were equivalent for the groups but if you look into the chemo radiation group uh, you'll see that 59 of the 166 patients required a tl uh, shortly after treatment 11 patients required a late uh, salvage laryngectomy for recurrence and if you look at their two-year follow-up although 101 patients did not have cancer, there was only 65 who actually had a functional larynx. So if you look at their tre treatment success rate, yes, it was equivalent to uh, surgery and radiation at about 60%, but their functional preservation rate, rate was quite lower at 39%. Uh, but in the end, what does this mean? It means really that uh, chemo radiation is uh, going to be used for advanced larynx cancer still because survival is similar. So we will continue to see persistent and recurrent disease or a dysfunctional larynx from this treatment. So we need to know how to manage these patients. And despite how good some of our chemo radiation techniques have uh, improved, we're still seeing this. So it's just something we see quite a bit of. Uh, and again, they're challenging patients. Uh, for me, again, some of the more challenging cases and uh, patients I deal with both from the ablative and reconstructive side. So we know it's often could be their last chance at cure. A lot of times these patients are coming from outside hospitals. We don't really know their initial cancer stage and how they are exactly were treated. Uh, their necks are often scarred and fibrotic. Uh, they have wound healing issues, et cetera. So here are just some challenges and questions that I like to think about uh, and that we'll go through today. And uh, again, uh, feel free to use the chat function. I've never used this before, but I'll take a look at that in the Q&A. This should be about 40 minutes and then I'll have uh, hopefully a little bit of time for questions before I go to the operating room. So how big should I make my margins? Uh, so we know that the five-year overall survival rate for primary chemo radiation is about 50 to 60 percent. Following a salvage TL, even a successful one, that drops down to 40 percent. We know in the setting of positive margins in a salvage TL operation, the, uh, the survival is quite dismal. Uh, 
Oh, you know, sorry, I was going to try to do a poll, but I was unable to set that up on the webinar, but uh, uh, we'll skip that. Uh, but we do know that positive margins negatively impact overall survival and disease-free survival. What I think about is just getting wide around this tumor and being ready for uh, uh, any sort of reconstruction. So you know going into a primary TL, if you're going to have enough mucosa to preserve most of the time just by looking at your scope exam, uh, and you'll be able to close primarily. The issue with some of these salvage cases is that larynx is really kind of socked in. Uh, you can't really see the tumor that well in scope. You don't really know how far out those tumor margins are going uh, in the dysplastic areas. Uh, so I use frozen sections, make sure to get around it, but be prepared uh, at the end to realize you don't have enough pharynx to close primarily and be ready for some sort of flap uh, reconstruction. Uh, should I perform neck dissections in the salvage setting? Another poll that I was trying to set up, sorry. Um, this was one of uh, a larger trial uh, or study looking at the clinical N0 neck in salvage laryngectomy surgery. And what they found was a 17% occult nodal MET rate. They found that it was higher for T4A tumors at 34%, as well as supraglide primaries, so things that make sense to us. And there's been uh, a couple large meta-analysis looking at the same thing and the occult nodal MET rate in a clinical N0 salvage neck is uh, 17%. So we know in the, in the primary setting, we think somewhere around 15 to 20% nodal MET rate, we should be performing an elective neck dissection. So it certainly make, makes sense for a primary TL, and we do that for most of the time T4 tumors for sure. Uh, does it make sense in a salvage uh, uh, laryngectomy situation? There have been many retrospective studies looking at this and looking at survival and most say that it does not affect survival and just increases the risk of complications afterward. afterwards. Higher fistula rates, uh, often issues, uh, more issues with thyroid uh, dysfunction and parathyroid dysfunction. And then uh, a, a couple have shown that survivals could be even worse. Does it matter if they were clinically N positive prior to their non-surgical treatment? Uh, this is a, a small study that was looking at patients who were clinically N0 at the time of their salvage laryngectomy, but did have positive nodes uh, or nodal disease prior to their first round of treatment. And uh, what they found and what another study found was that this occult nodal MET rate was uh, uh, the same, so roughly about 15 to 20 percent. So uh, here's what I do. Of course, if they're clinically N positive by exam or imaging, I'm performing a neck dissection. I uh, often we will not do a clinical N0 uh, salvage neck in a salvage laryngectomy case unless they're T4A uh, or supraglottic, um, but uh, uh, I'll consider it in those situations. It does not seem that the initial clinical and positive neck is at higher risk for harboring occult met, so that doesn't really influence me. If I am doing a free flap or someone's doing a free flap, I certainly uh, think about um, uh, the vessels and where they're going to be. Uh, so if it's a T4A tumor lateralized, I'll often do a kind of a, a, a mini neck on that side to clear out space for the vessels and make sure there isn't any recurrence in that area. Uh, what could I do to limit uh, some complications? Uh, first one we'll talk about is hypoparathyroidism. Uh, fairly high incidence after salvage laryngectomy uh, with a, quite a range of 10 to 40%. We all know those immediate signs to look for. Uh, there are risk factors for hypocalcemia. If you do a neck dissection, uh, uh, that certainly increases the risk as well as a thyroidectomy and both of these have to do with uh, just blood supply preservation to the parathyroid glands. Uh, it's been found that even if you preserve one thyroid lobe, you uh, the risk does not necessarily decrease after that. And unfortunately, uh, there's no predictors of severe hypocalcemia. We do uh, use the postoperative PTH of about 10 to 15 as a predictive marker of uh, hypoparathyroidism after. Uh, what I do is, um, I uh, again, since I'm not often performing neck dissections in the salvage setting. Uh, when I am on the side of, uh, uh, or the opposite side of the tumor, I make sure to really hug uh, that lar laryngeal structure, try not to make the large tunnels along the carotid, uh, and try to preserve the blood supply to the parathyroids. 
So hypothyroidism, this is very common. 40% of patients uh, who are going into their salvage TL uh, surgery will already be hypothyroid after radiation. This normally peaks around 10 to 12 months after, after radiation. So uh, it's something our radiation oncologists are thinking a lot about. I, in general, think we, we tend to not think about thyroid function that much. And it's something I constantly try to remind myself to do, make sure to get uh, TFTs on patients uh, going into their salvage TL uh, surgery, making sure they're as optimized as possible. And this number goes up. So 40% of patients a year after radiation will be hypothyroid. After salvage surgery, despite all our best efforts, uh, patients, uh, the, ri the risk of uh, hypothyroidism jumps to about 80%. And this is also, despite preserving a thyroid lobe, uh, we do think neck dissection is the big, uh, one of the biggest things here uh, to cause it. Uh, with the sacrifice of the blood supply. Uh, and what's important to note is in a, a salvage surgery, the thyroid is often rarely involved in only one to 10% of cases. So uh, what I do, if it's a clinical T4A tumor, I will remove the ipsilateral lobe if it's coming through. Of course, if it's uh, a large tumor uh, coming through the thyroid cartilage and crossing midline, I'll remove the whole thyroid. The side of the contralateral lobe, if I'm preserving it, I really do my best to hug that thyroid uh, and laryngeal framework, save that superior thyroid pole, come down to the midline, flip everything over, and again, not create that tunnel between the carotid and the uh, thyroid to preserve uh, both the blood supply to the thyroid as well as the blood supply to the uh, parathyroids. Um, if the patient is on supplementation already uh, and you're worried about getting around the tumor, for sure, take the whole thyroid. Uh, if they're not on supplementation, I think you should tell them that the chances are that they will be at some point. Uh, if you're doing a, a, you know, an early salvage surgery less than a year after um, uh, radiation, they might not have reached their uh, hypothyroid nadir anyway. Uh, but for sure, after doing this surgery, uh, that, that risk increases. And again, stay on the capsule to do your best to preserve those parathyroids afterwards. Uh, this is probably the one we know about the most after salvage laryngectomy, the pharyngocutaneous fistula, and I'll spend a decent amount of time on this and just going through some of the reconstructive aspects of uh, how to prevent this after uh, salvage TL. Uh, so depending on where you read, this is the, there's a very high rate of this happening, 5 to 65 percent. Uh, you all know that these are incredibly morbid. They lengthen the hospitalization for these patients and, of course, the cost associated with that. And then if there is any chance of getting further radiation or treatment of any type, uh, these often uh, delay that uh, because the, our oncologists want for, you know, for the most part, uh, these uh, fistulas to be healed uh, prior to treatment. Many risk factors for developing pharyngocutaneous fistulas. I think the one that we kind of think about the most is prior radiation, which is the scenario, the salvage TL setting. Uh, but again, important to think about all these other things leading into a salvage TL case, uh, just to make sure uh, the patient is as optimized as possible for, for good wound healing after surgery. So how do, you, how do you reconstruct these? Obviously, we all know that immediate reconstruction is preferred. That's the new, uh, not the new way, but the, the way we've been doing it for quite some time now. Uh, primary goal is to limit potential for life-threatening post-operative complications. So we need some sort of tissue in there to protect great vessels. Uh, obviously separate off the respiratory and digestive tracts and prevent any leakage down into the mediastinum. And then secondarily, once we make the patient safe, we can start thinking about speech rehab as well as um, uh, uh, PO and starting the patient eating again. So here are the, the, the closure techniques for a laryngectomy defect. You could close primarily if you have enough mucosa uh, you could close primarily and use some sort of regional flap, often a pectoralis flap, uh, sometimes a DP flap or supraclavicular island flap, uh, sort of bolster for extra uh, layer, uh, and then uh, we're often using free flaps now. 
So primary closure versus pectoralis flap. This is uh, a study from 2013, a multi-institutional study with 360 patients. They were looking at different techniques for closing uh, salvage laryngectomy defects. Uh, and first looking at the primary closure versus uh, regional pec flap, uh, they found that the fistula rate for primary closure was 34%. This dropped down to 15% with a uh, pectoralis onlay flap. So that's primary closure and then using a pec uh, muscle, no skin, but just laying it on top of your closure to kind of bolster it. So a significant decrease in the rate of fistula and also looking at the duration of fistula when it did happen, the pec onlay flap had a shorter duration. So uh, you, you know, the main takeaway home point from this is non-irradiated healthy tissue uh, helps decrease the rate of fistula. So the pec flap is, uh, as you know, uh, quite a workhorse flap for head and neck surgery. It is a uh, flap that's based off of the pectoral branch of the thoracobromial artery. What's nice is most reconstructions are done in a single stage. And it can be used in two ways. One is without the skin, so a pec major myofascial flap. Uh, two is with the skin, the pec major myocutaneous flap. So uh, what's the difference between those? When do we use those? Uh, Jonas Johnson uh, looked at pec onlays, so that's primary closure of the mucosa and then laying the muscle over top versus an interposition of uh, pec skin in a defect. Uh, they looked at 73 patients and they noted that there was an incredibly high complication rate with the pec myocutaneous interposition flap. What they thought was that this had to do with uh, uh, partial skin loss. And if you've ever seen one of these, uh, you have this nice healthy muscle and if you keep a skin paddle attached to it, there's kind of some whimsy uh, uh, perforators going into it through the fat. And when you're transposing this flap up through the neck, uh, the thought is that some of these could be sheared off and you could lose some of the skin paddle. And of course, if that skin paddle is inset into your mucosa, uh, uh, that could lead to a fistula rate. So looking at their uh, fistula uh, rates, of course, uh, and again, they saw for primary closure alone, there was quite a high rate of fistula in their group, about 45%. This dropped down to 29%. Uh, with a myocutaneous flap, which they did, still did not think was acceptable, uh, but with the on light pec flap, uh, that went down to 10%. And then uh, next up the ladder is the free flap. So if we're dealing with a salvage laryngectomy defect where we have less than 1.5 centimeters of posterior pharyngeal wall, that's kind of considered the number where you could stretch that and close it on itself. Uh, to not have too, uh, too big of a, a stenotic segment. So if we're dealing with less than that, our options now uh, come down to that myocutaneous pec flap, which uh, appears to not be a great option, or using the uh, a free flap. Uh, this uh, uh, large multi-institutional study also looked at free flaps versus the onlay pec flaps. And what they noted was that the, both the pec flap and the free flap had improved rates compared to primary closure alone. You'd see that the actual difference between free flaps and pec flaps was not stati statistically significant and it actually looks like pec flap uh, was a little better. Uh, but they did see that when a, a fistula did develop, there was a shorter duration of the fistula when a free flap was used and that was uh, fairly significant. So we know there's pros and cons to each. Uh, of course, uh, with free flaps, there's a little extra monitoring, longer operative time, often longer, longer length of stay. I think the big thing to think about is uh, donor site morbidity. So when I'm thinking about using a PEC versus a free flap, I often uh, consider now the free flap to have less morbidity. Uh, so the ALT and the radial forearm are the ones that we're often using. These are fascio-cutaneous and uh, 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 especially for the ALT, uh, minimal, motor, uh, minimal donor site morbidity as opposed to the pec major, where we know that there's significant range of month, uh, motion and strength reduction. Patients are often quite in pain after surgery, leading to some splinting. Uh, studies have shown that TEP speech is impaired. Um, and then, then cosmetically, there's often just a larger bulky piece of tissue up in the neck. 
So in general, I like to save the pec flap uh, as a rescue flap and free flaps are the, the my new gold standard, most people's new gold standard for reconstruction of these defects. So here's the free flaps that uh, you are all familiar with uh, that are commonly used. Radial forearm based off of the radial artery. Uh, again, fascio cutaneous, uh, thin pliable skin. Uh, you can get a fairly decent skin paddle. If you're looking for bulk, probably not the best flap. ALT is great because uh, you could take a very large ALT and shape it down to size uh, after the fact uh, and have some good bulk. In terms of donor site morbidity, comparing ALT to forearm, ALT is thought to be a little uh, uh, superior. As you know, you're just, you're just left with an incision on the side of your leg, but patients are up and walking uh, really the next day. As opposed to the forearm, there's some uh, wound uh, uh, issues to deal with and sometimes complications occur with that. And then uh, just to finish up uh, here, I just wanted to walk through a salvage laryngectomy uh, reconstruction. So here, just to orient, here's the tube. Uh, stomas uh, brought up to the neck, chin up here, uh, carotids. And you can see, uh, sure, uh, definitely looks like a radiated uh, neck. We have maybe a centimeter and a half here of uh, a usable posterior pharyngeal strip. Here's the esophageal inlet. Here's the base of tongue. We're definitely going to need some sort of flap to cover this. And it would also be nice uh, to have tissue off laterally covering the carotid artery. So in cases like this, I would choose an ALT. And again, you can take a large ALT and then do your measurements and shape it down to size. Uh, really, all I do is measure from the base of tongue to the esophageal inlet, and then the esophageal inlet up to the posterior tracheal wall and create this, what we what I call it, a suprastomal chevron, and this is just a monitoring paddle. Uh, so this part is going to be buried in the neck, so you're going to de-epithelialize it. This part won't be needed, so you can just get rid of it. I do all this while it's still connected to the uh, leg to uh, just decrease the time, the ischemia time of the flap. So here's that external skin paddle. Here's the part that's de-epithelialized and will be buried inside uh, the neck. Start the inset at the esophageal inlet and behind here is that uh, epithelialized component and pretty much we're going to work our way up the pharyngeal walls here. Uh, I place a salivary bypass tube uh, in pretty much every salvage case I do. Um, I think it helps with uh, stenosis and helps to do what it says it does and have some of that saliva uh, bypass the reconstruction. Uh, so normally this is like a 8 or a 10 French and then I suture a red rubber to it and this red rubber comes up through the nose and gets secured to the septum. So when you see them in clinic a couple weeks later all you do is cut the stitch in the nose and then reach back in the back of their uh, oral pharynx, grab the red rubber with a, a Kelly and pull the whole thing out through. Um, so again, yeah, 10 to 14 secured to the nasal septum. Uh, studies have shown a decrease in, in fist, fistula rate and theoretically should reduce stenosis as well. Uh, for salvage TL cases, I keep them in for two weeks uh, at, the, at the minimum. So here's that uh, salivary bypass tube going into place. It fits in nicely in the base of the tongue and then the red rubbers drop down through the nose and sutured to it. Here it is now the red rubber attached coming out of the nose and we start closing the flap over it. In general I like to close up one of the pharyngeal walls, the side that's opposite the uh, uh, I'm sorry, the side that is on the same side as where the anastomosis is going to be. I leave my last stitches to be not on the base of the tongue, but on the contralateral lateral wall, because that's easier than sewing your last stitches in the base of the tongue. But I make sure it's on the contralateral pharyngeal wall, opposite side of the anastomosis, just in case uh, there's any leak. That's, I think, where likely the leak will be, and I'll keep it away from my pedicle. Uh, so here's some of those last stitches going in. Again, throw the stitches, lateral pharyngeal wall, not on the base of tongue, opposite side of the pedicle. And here where this arrow is, you can see the extra ALT 
uh, that's going to be flipped up to create uh, the superstomal chevron. Uh, I find this incredibly useful for you know the, a variety of reasons. One, of course, it's great for monitoring this buried flap. It's often the most distal part of the flap. So if you're getting uh, a perforator signal or on this or a Doppler, Doppler signal and it looks healthy, you feel really good about it. Also, if there's extra skin removed, uh, you can make a very large chevron and uh, uh, help cover the neck. Uh, and oftentimes in situations where I thought I would need to do a second flap uh, or a pec flap to go with it, I just created a bigger chevron and was able to cover it. And I'm always surprised how much tissue you could get out of the ALT. Uh, despite that, uh, there are cases where multiple flaps are needed. I'm not sure how this is showing up for you, but uh, uh, just a gentleman with uh, significant disease of the neck uh, where a large swath of skin had to be taken and I used a very large chevron which is here and then underneath this yellow zeroform bolster is a pec flap from the contralateral side. In terms of function uh, we uh, make sure to get SLP working with these patients early. I have them use an electrolarynx uh, uh, before surgery and that's kind of their main mode of uh, communication afterwards. I don't put in TEPs at the time of salvage laryngectomy. Um, that's just the, the way I was taught and uh, seems to have worked out well for me uh, so far. Um, of course, stomach care and uh, um, swallowing exercises start around two weeks. So here's uh, how I uh, and my colleagues do it, uh, uh, manage TL patients at UC. Again, pre-op SLP evaluation. We often are using an ALT. Uh, and luckily don't have issues with very large ALTs. If we do, uh, we, we will switch to a radial forearm. Uh, I think all of us place salary bypass tube uh, placement. We have them MPO for two weeks, then remove the salary bypass tube, and then uh, start them on SIPs. I uh, uh, sometimes get esophagrams. Uh, if they look like they're healing well, though, I'll often just have them start uh, on a clear diet and see how things go and advance from there. Um, and then once they're fully healed, uh, then get a TEP secondarily. Uh, so just to conclude, negative margins are key. Uh, make sure to use frozen sections and uh, go big and just be ready for a larger defect. Uh, neck dissections are often not necessary in the clinical N0 setting, uh, but certainly consider on the side of a flap. Uh, really counsel your patients on postoperative complications and do your best to uh, just make sure they're as uh, nutritionally optimized as possible going into surgery. And then when you're closing a defect, really think about the use of non-irradiated tissue uh, to help with reconstruction. And that is it. Thank you. Do you keep, here's, here's just a question. Do you keep patients in-house while MPO or send them home on tube feeds? Uh, in general, a, a flat patient of ours is staying in the hospital for seven days. Uh, so they're going home on post-op day seven, seven or eight on tube feeds, and then coming back uh, a week after that. So that's their 14 day mark. And at that point in clinic, I'm taking out the salivary bypass tube. Um, and then um, uh, if they look like they're healed, I'll start them sipping. I'll probably have them go home with the feeding tube still just in case uh, uh, there's any issues uh, and have that removed hopefully uh, within a week after that. What makes you decide what makes you decide using an NG tube for feeding versus having a peg placed at the time of surgery? I'd say it seems like about half of these patients have pegs uh, going into this operation just because they're not too far from radiation and they've been having issues or they're a dysfunctional larynx. Um, uh, sometimes uh, we just get them a peg when they're in-house. I don't place my own pegs and it's kind of challenging to do that at the time of surgery. Uh, so uh, uh, that would be the main issue. How long after salvage laryngectomy do you perform a TEP? Six to eight, six, eight weeks in office placement versus under sedation. I do them all uh, general. If there's a flap in there, I find it very challenging sometimes. It's not as straightforward as the primary ones. So I wait uh, uh, 
at least six weeks. Um, I see how they're doing. If they're really antsy about doing that, I, I could get them in around six to eight weeks, um, but somewhere in that time period. Um, and then I use the, the, the there's this Provox Vega kind of uh, Seldinger technique uh, kit, which is really nice. Do patients generally tolerate the red rubber attached to the salary of by a pest tube? How is removal tolerated? Uh, yeah, they, they often don't even know, uh, don't even remember that it was placed there. Sometimes they say, oh, I noticed this red thing sticking out of my nose. Uh, removal is very easy. It's really just a tongue depressor. Hold their tongue down, grab the red rubber and pull it out. They're always surprised how big that salivary bypass tube is. I did have one case where um, the patient came in two weeks later and said, oh, that red thing in my nose isn't there anymore. And I looked and it wasn't. And what happened was the stitch broke through their septum and they started to swallow it. So I had to go get an esophagus scope from the OR and scope their uh, neopharynx in clinic. And it was about, I don't know, halfway down. Um, so I just make sure when I place it that uh, I think it's secure, uh, but I've not had issues with removing it in clinic. Great. Thank you, Dr. Helton, for your talk. That was great. Yes, thanks, Brett. And, um, we uh, encourage anybody who, who wants to join on as faculty at any point, or if you want to come back in a few weeks, if you guys aren't ramped up clinically, feel free to sign back up and come, come back and talk. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. All right. We will uh, take a little bit of a break here and then start at the 10 o'clock hour for those out there in the audience. Um,